Story two of A Changed Man and Other Tales by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two The Waiting Supper, Chapters One through Four. Chapter One Whoever had perceived the yeoman standing on Squire Everard's lawn in the dusk of that October evening fifty years ago might have said at first sight that he was loitering there from idle curiosity for a large five-light window of the manor-house in front of him was unshuttered and uncurtained so that the illuminated room within could be scanned almost to its four corners obviously nobody was ever expected to be in this part of the grounds after nightfall the apartment thus swept by an eye from without was occupied by two persons they were sitting over dessert the tablecloth having been removed in the old-fashioned way the fruits were local consisting of apples pears nuts and such other products of the summer as might be presumed to grow on the estate there was strong ale and rum on the table and but little wine moreover the appointments of the dining-room were simple and homely even for the date betokening a countrified household of the smaller gentry without much wealth or ambition formerly a numerous class but now in great part ousted by the territorial landlords one of the two sitters was a young lady in white muslin who listened somewhat impatiently to the remarks of her companion an elderly rubicund personage whom the merest stranger could have pronounced to be her father the watcher evinced no signs of moving and it became evident that affairs were not so simple as they first had seemed the tall farmer was in fact no accidental spectator and he stood by premeditation close to the trunk of a tree so that had any traveller passed along the road without the park gate or even round the lawn to the door that person would scarce have noticed the other notwithstanding that the gate was quite near at hand and the park little larger than a paddock there was still light enough in the western heaven to brighten faintly one side of the man's face and to show against the trunk of the tree behind the admirable cut of his profile also to reveal that the front of the manor-house small though it seemed was solidly built of stone in that never-to-be-surpassed style for the english country residence the mullioned and transomed elizabethan the lawn although neglected was still as level as a bowling green which indeed it might once have served for and the blades of grass before the window were raked by the candle shine which stretched over them so far as to touch the yeoman's face in front within the dining-room there were also with one of the twain the same signs of a hidden purpose that marked the farmer the young lady's mind was straying as clearly into the shadows as that of the loiterer was fixed upon the room nay it could be said that she was quite conscious of his presence outside impatience caused her foot to beat silently on the carpet and she more than once rose to leave the table this proceeding was checked by her father who would put out his hand upon her shoulder and unceremoniously press her down into her chair till he should have concluded his observations her replies were brief enough and there was factitiousness in her smiles of assent to his views a small iron casement between two of the mullions was open and some occasional words of the dialogue were audible without as for drains how can i put in drains the pipes don't cost much that's true but the labour in sinking the trenches is ruination and then the gates they should be hung to stone posts otherwise there's no keeping them up through the harvest the squire's voice was strongly toned with the local accent so that he said drains and gates like the rustics on his estate the landscape without grew darker and the young man's figure seemed to be absorbed into the trunk of the tree the small stars filled in between the larger the nebulae between the small stars the trees quite lost their voice and if there was still a sound it was from the cascade of a stream which stretched along under the trees that bounded the lawn on its northern side 
At last the young girl did get to her feet and secure her retreat. "'I have something to do, papa,' she said. "'I shall not be in the drawing-room just yet.' "'Very well,' replied he. "'Then I won't hurry.' and closing the door behind her he drew his decanters together and settled down in his chair three minutes after that a woman's shape emerged from the drawing-room window and passing through a wall door to the entrance front came across the grass she kept well clear of the dining-room window but enough of its light fell on her to show escaping from the dark hooded cloak that she wore stray verges of the same light dress which had figured but recently at the dinner-table the hood was contracted tight about her face with a drawing-string making her countenance small and baby-like and lovelier even than before without hesitation she brushed across the grass to the tree under which the young man stood concealed the moment she had reached him he enclosed her form with his arm the meeting and embrace though by no means formal were yet not passionate the whole proceeding was that of persons who had repeated the act so often as to be unconscious of its performance she turned within his arm and faced in the same direction with himself which was towards the window and thus they stood without speaking the back of her head leaning against his shoulder for a while each seemed to be thinking his or her diverse thoughts you have kept me waiting a long time dear christine he said at last i wanted to speak to you particularly or i should not have stayed how came you to be dining at this time of night father has been out all day and dinner was put back till six i know i have kept you but nicholas how can i help it sometimes if i am not to run any risk my poor father insists upon my listening to all he has to say since my brother left he has had nobody else to listen to him and to-night he was particularly tedious on his usual topics draining and tenant farmers and the village people i must take daddy to london he gets so narrow always staying here and what did you say to it all well i took the part of the tenant farmers of course as the beloved of one should in duty do there followed a little break or gasp implying a strangled sigh you are sorry you have encouraged that beloving one oh no nicholas what is it you want to see me for particularly i know you are sorry as time goes on and everything is at a deadlock with no prospect of change and your rural swain loses his freshness only think this secret understanding between us has lasted near three year ever since you was a little over sixteen yes it has been a long time and i an untamed uncultivated man who has never seen london and knows nothing about society at all not uncultivated dear nicholas untravelled socially unpractised if you will she said smiling well i did sigh but not because i regret being your promised one what i do sometimes regret is that the scheme which my meetings with you are but a part of has not been carried out completely you said nicholas that if i consented to swear to keep faith with you you would go away and travel and see nations and peoples and cities and take a professor with you and study books and art simultaneously with your study of men and manners and then come back at the end of two years when i should find that my father would by no means be indisposed to accept you as a son-in-law you said your reason for wishing to get my promise before starting was that your mind would then be more at rest when you were far away and so could give itself more completely to knowledge than if you went as my unaccepted lover only fuming with anxiety as to how i should be when you came back i saw how reasonable that was and solemnly swore myself to you in consequence but instead of going to see the world you stay on and on here to see me and you don't want me to see you yes no oh, it's not that it is that i have latterly felt frightened at what i am doing when not in your actual presence 
it seems so wicked not to tell my father that i have a lover close at hand within touch and view of both of us whereas if you were absent my conduct would not seem quite so treacherous the realities would not stare at one so you would be a pleasant dream to me which i should be free to indulge in without reproach of my conscience i should live in hopeful expectation of your returning fully qualified to boldly claim me of my father there i have been terribly frank i know he in his turn had lapsed into gloomy breathings now i did plan it as you state he answered i did mean to go away the moment i had your promise but dear christine i did not foresee two or three things i did not know what a lot of pain it would cost to tear myself from you and i did not know that my stingy uncle heaven forgive me calling him so would so flatly refuse to advance me money for my purpose the scheme of travelling with a first-rate tutor costing a formidable sum of money you have no idea what it would cost but i have said that i'll find the money oh there he returned you have hit a sore place to speak truly dear i would rather stay unpolished a hundred years than take your money but why men continually use the money of the women they marry yes but not till afterwards no man would like to touch your money at present and i should feel very mean if i were to do so in present circumstances that brings me to what i was going to propose but no upon the whole i will not propose it now ah i would guarantee expenses and you won't let me the money is my personal possession it comes to me from my late grandfather and not from my father at all he laughed forcedly and pressed her hand there are more reasons why i cannot tear myself away he added what would become of my uncle's farming six hundred acres in this parish and five hundred in the next a constant traipsing from one farm to the other he can't be in two places at once still that might be got over if it were not for the other matters besides dear i still should be a little uneasy even though i have your promise lest somebody should snap you up away from me ah you should have thought of that before otherwise i have committed myself for nothing i should have thought of it he answered gravely but i did not there lies my fault i admit it freely ah if you would only commit yourself a little more i might at least get over that difficulty but i won't ask you you have no idea how much you are to me still you could not argue so coolly if you had what property belongs to you i hate the very sound of it is you i care for i wish you hadn't a farthing in the world but what i could earn for you i don't altogether wish that she murmured i wish it because it would have made what i was going to propose much easier to do than it is now indeed i will not propose it although i came on purpose after what you have said in your frankness nonsense nick come tell me how can you be so touchy look at this then christine dear he drew from his breast pocket a sheet of paper and unfolded it when it was observable that a seal dangled from the bottom what is it she held the paper sideways so that what there was of window light fell on its surface i can only read the old english letters why our names surely it is not a marriage license it is she trembled oh nick how could you do this and without telling me why should i have thought i must tell you you had not spoken frankly then as you have now we have been all to each other more than these two years and i thought i would propose that we marry privately and that i then leave you on the instant i would have taken my travelling bag to church and you would have gone home alone i should not have started on my adventures in the brilliant manner of our original plan but should have roughed it a little at first my great gain would have been that the absolute possession of you would have enabled me to work with spirit and purpose such as nothing else could do but i dare not ask you now so frank as you have been she did not answer 
the document he had produced gave such unexpected substantiality to the venture with which she had so long toyed as a vague dream merely that she was in truth frightened a little i don't know about it she said perhaps not ah my little lady you are wearying of me no nick responded she creeping closer i am not upon my word and truth and honour i am not nick a mere tiller of the soil as i should be called he continued without heeding her and you well a daughter of one of the i won't say oldest families because that's absurd all families are the same age one of the longest chronicled families about here whose name is actually the name of the place that's not much i am sorry to say my poor brother but i won't speak of that well she murmured mischievously after a pause you certainly would not need to be uneasy if i were to do this that you want me to do you would have me safe enough in your trap then i couldn't get away that's just it he said vehemently it is a trap you feel it so and that though you wouldn't be able to get away from me you might particularly wish to ah if i had asked you two years ago you would have agreed instantly but i thought i was bound to wait for the proposal to come from you as the superior now you are angry and take seriously what i meant purely in fun you don't know me even yet to show you that you have not been mistaken in me i do propose to carry out this license i'll marry you dear nicholas to-morrow morning Ah christine i am afraid i have stung you on to this so that i cannot no 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 she hastily rejoined and there was something in her tone which suggested that she had been put upon her mettle and would not flinch take me whilst i am in the humour what church is the license for that i've not looked to see why our parish church here of course ah then we cannot use it we dare not be married here we do dare said she and we will too if you'll be there if i'll be there they speedily came to an agreement that he should be in the church porch at ten minutes to eight on the following morning awaiting her and that immediately after the conclusion of the service which would make them one nicholas should set out on his long deferred educational tour towards the cost of which she was resolving to bring a substantial subscription with her to church then slipping from him she went indoors by the way she had come and nicholas bent his steps homeward chapter two instead of leaving the spot by the gate he flung himself over the fence and pursued a direction towards the river under the trees and it was now in his lonely progress that he showed for the first time outwardly that he was not altogether unworthy of her he wore long water-boots reaching above his knees and instead of making a circuit to find a bridge by which he might cross the froom the river aforesaid he made straight for the point whence proceeded the low roar that was at this hour the only evidence of the stream's existence he speedily stood on the verge of the waterfall which caused the noise and stepped into the water at the top of the fall waded through with the sure tread of one who knew every inch of his footing even though the canopy of trees rendered the darkness almost absolute and a false step would have precipitated him into the pool beneath soon reaching the boundary of the grounds he continued in the same direct line to traverse the alluvial valley full of brooks and tributaries to the main stream in former times quite impassable and impassable in winter now sometimes he would cross a deep gully on a plank not wider than the hand at another time he ploughed his way through beds of spear-grass where at a few feet to the right or left he might have been sucked down into a morass at last he reached firm land on the other side of this watery tract and came to his house on the rise behind elsenford an ordinary farmstead from the back of which rose indistinct breathings belchings and snortings the rattle of halters and other familiar features of an agriculturalist's home 
while nicholas long was packing his bag in an upper room of this dwelling miss christine everard sat at a desk in her own chamber at frum everard manor house looking with pale fixed countenance at the candles i ought i must now she whispered to herself i should not have begun it if i had not meant to carry it through it runs in the blood of us i suppose she alluded to a fact unknown to her lover the clandestine marriage of an aunt under circumstances somewhat similar to the present in a few minutes she had penned the following note october thirteenth eighteen thirty dear mr bieland can you make it convenient to yourself to meet me at the church to-morrow morning at eight i name the early hour because it would suit me better than later on in the day you will find me in the chancel if you can come an answer yes or no by the bearer of this will be sufficient christine everard she sent the note to the rector immediately waiting at a small side door of the house till she heard the servant's footsteps returning along the lane when she went round and met him in the passage the rector had taken the trouble to write a line and answered that he would meet her with pleasure a dripping fog which ushered in the next morning was highly favourable to the scheme of the pair at that time of the century frum everard house had not been altered and enlarged the public lane passed close under its walls and there was a door opening directly from one of the old parlours the south parlour as it was called into the lane which led to the village christine came out this way and after following the lane for a short distance entered upon a path within a belt of plantation by which the church could be reached privately she even avoided the churchyard gate walking along to a place where the turf without the low wall rose into a mound enabling her to mount upon the coping and spring down inside she crossed the wet graves and so glided round to the door he was there with his bag in his hand he kissed her with a sort of surprise as if he had expected that at the last moment her heart would fail her though it had not failed her there was nevertheless no great ardour in christine's bearing merely the momentum of an antecedent impulse they went up the aisle together the bottle green glass of the old lead quarries admitting but little light at that hour and under such an atmosphere they stood by the altar rail in silence christine's skirt visibly quivering at each beat of her heart presently a quick step ground upon the gravel and mr bieland came round by the front he was a quiet bachelor courteous towards christine and not at first recognizing in nicholas a neighbouring yeoman for he lived aloofly in the next parish advanced to her without revealing any surprise at her unusual request but in truth he was surprised the keen interest taken by many country young women at the present day in church decoration and festivals being then unknown good morning he said and repeated the same words to nicholas more mechanically good morning she replied gravely mr bieland i have a serious reason for asking you to meet me us i may say we wish you to marry us the rector's gaze hardened to fixity rather between than upon either of them and he neither moved nor replied for some time ah he said at last and we are quite ready i had no idea oh, it has been kept rather private she said calmly where are your witnesses they are outside in the meadow sir i can call them in a moment said nicholas oh i see it is uh, mr nicholas long said mr bieland and turning again to christine does your father know of this is it necessary that i should answer that question mr bieland i am afraid it is highly necessary christine began to look concerned where is the license the rector asked since there have been no bans nicholas produced it mr bieland read it an operation which occupied him several minutes or at least he made it appear so till christine said impatiently we are quite ready mr bieland will you proceed mr long has to take a journey of a great many miles to-day and you no i remain mr bieland assumed firmness 
there is something wrong in this he said i cannot marry you without your father's presence but have you a right to refuse us interposed nicholas i believe we are in a position to demand your fulfilment of our request no you are not is miss everard of age i think not i think she is months from being so eh huh, miss everard am i bound to tell that certainly at any rate you are bound to write it meanwhile i refuse to solemnize the service and let me entreat you two young people to do nothing so rash as this even if by going to some strange church you may do so without discovery the tragedy of marriage tragedy certainly it is full of crises and catastrophes and ends with the death of one of the actors the tragedy of marriage as i was saying is one i shall not be a party to your beginning with such light hearts and i shall feel bound to put your father on his guard miss everard think better of it i entreat you remember the proverb marry in haste and repent at leisure christine spurred by opposition almost stormed at him nicholas implored but nothing would turn that obstinate rector she sat down and reflected by and by she confronted mr bieland our marriage is not to be this morning i see she said now grant me one favour and in return i'll promise you to do nothing rashly do not tell my father a word of what has happened here i agree if you undertake not to elope she looked at nicholas and he looked at her do you wish me to elope nick she asked no he said so the compact was made and they left the church singly nicholas remaining till the last and closing the door on his way home carrying the well-packed bag which was just now to go no further the two men who were mending water carriers in the meadows approached the hedge as if they had been on the alert all the time you said you may want us for summit sir all right never mind he answered through the hedge i do not require you after all chapter three at a manor not far away there lived a queer and primitive couple who had lately been blessed with a son and heir the christening took place during the week under notice and this had been followed by a feast to the parishioners christine's father one of the same generation and kind had been asked to drive over and assist in the entertainment and christine as a matter of course accompanied him when they reached athenhall as the house was called they found the usually quiet nook a lively spectacle tables had been spread in the apartment which lent its name to the whole building the hall proper covered with a fine open timbered roof whose braces purlins and rafters made a brown thicket of oak overhead here tenantry of all ages sat with their wives and families and the servants were assisted in their ministrations by the sons and daughters of the owner's friends and neighbours christine lent a hand among the rest she was holding a plate in each hand towards a huge brown platter of baked rice pudding from which a footman was scooping a large spoonful when a voice reached her ear over her shoulder allow me to hold them for you christine turned and recognized in the speaker the nephew of the entertainer a young man from london whom she had already met on two or three occasions she accepted the proffered help and from that moment whenever he passed her in their marchings to and fro during the remainder of the serving he smiled acquaintance when their work was done he improved the few words into a conversation he plainly had been attracted by her fairness Belston was a self-assured young man, not particularly good-looking, with more colour in his skin than even Nicholas had. He had flushed a little in attracting her notice, though the flush had nothing of nervousness in it, the air with which it was accompanied making it curiously suggestive of a flush of anger, and even when he laughed it was difficult to banish that fancy the late autumn sunlight streamed in through the window-panes upon the heads and shoulders of the venerable patriarchs of the hamlet and upon the middle-aged and upon the young 
upon men and women who had played out or were to play tragedies or tragic comedies in that nook of civilization not less great essentially than those which enacted on more central arenas fix the attention of the world one of the party was a cousin of nicholas long's who sat with her husband and children to make himself as locally harmonious as possible mr bellston remarked to his companion on the scene it does one's heart good he said to see these simple peasants enjoying themselves oh mr bellston exclaimed christine don't be too sure about that word simple you little think what they see and meditate their reasonings and emotions are as complicated as ours she spoke with a vehemence which would have been hardly present in her words but for her own relation to nicholas the sense of that produced in her a nameless depression thenceforward the young man however still followed her up i am glad to hear you say it he returned warmly i was merely attuning myself to your mood as i thought the real truth is that i know more of the parthians and medes and dwellers in mesopotamia almost of any people indeed than of the english rustics travel and exploration are my profession not the study of the british peasantry travel there was sufficient coincidence between his declaration and the course she had urged upon her lover to lend bellston's account of himself a certain interest in christine's ears he might perhaps be able to tell her something that would be useful to nicholas if their dream were carried out a door opened from the hall into the garden and she somehow found herself outside chatting with mr bellston on this topic till she thought that upon the whole she liked the young man the garden being his uncle's he took her round it with an air of proprietorship and they went on amongst the michaelmas daisies and chrysanthemums and through a door to the fruit garden a greenhouse was open and he went in and cut her a bunch of grapes how daring of you they are your uncles oh he don't mind i do anything here a rough old buffer isn't he she was thinking of her nick and felt that by comparison with her present acquaintance the farmer more than held his own as a fine and intelligent fellow but the harmony with her own existence in little things which she found here imparted an alien tinge to nicholas just now the latter idealized by moonlight or a thousand miles of distance was altogether a more romantic object for a woman's dream than this smart new lacquered man but in the sun of afternoon and amid a surrounding company mr bellston was a very tolerable companion when they entered the hall bellston entreated her to come with him up a spiral stair in the thickness of the wall leading to a passage and gallery whence they could look down upon the scene below the people had finished their feast the newly christened baby had been exhibited and a few words having been spoken to them they began amid a racketing of forms to make for the greensward without nicholas cousin and cousin's wife and cousin's children among the rest while they were filing out a voice was heard calling hello here jim where are you said bellston's uncle the young man descended christine following at leisure now will you be a good fellow the squire continued and set them going outside in some dance or other that they know i'm dog-tired and i want to have a few words with mr everard before we join em eh everard they are shy till somebody starts em afterwards they'll keep gwine brisk enough ay that they wool said squire everard they followed to the lawn and here it proved that james bellston was as shy or rather as averse as any of the tenantry themselves to acting the part of fugleman only the parish people had been at the feast but outlying neighbours had now strolled in for a dance they want speed the plough said bellston coming up breathless it must be a country dance i suppose now miss everard do have pity upon me i am supposed to lead off but really i know no more about speeding the plough than a child just born would you take one of the villagers just to start them my uncle says suppose you take that handsome young farmer over there i don't know his name but i dare say you do and i'll come on with one of the dairyman's daughters as a second couple 
Christine turned in the direction signified and changed colour, though in the shade nobody noticed it. "'Oh, yes, I know him,' she said coolly. "'He is from near our own place, Mr. Nicholas Long.' "'That's capital. Then you can easily make him stand as first couple with you. Now I must pick up mine.' I, I i think i'll dance with you mr bellston she said with some trepidation because you see she explained eagerly i know the figure and you don't so that i can help you while nicholas long i know is familiar with the figure and that will make two couples who know it which is necessary at least bellston showed his gratification by one of his angry pleasant flushes he had hardly dared to ask for what she proffered freely and having requested nicholas to take the dairyman's daughter led christine to her place long promptly stepping up second with his charge there were grim silent depths in nick's character a small deedy spark in his eye as it caught christine's was all that showed his consciousness of her then the fiddlers began the celebrated mellstock fiddlers who given free stripping could play from sunset to dawn without turning a hair the couples wheeled and swung nicholas taking christine's hand in the course of business with the figure when she waited for him to give it a little squeeze but he did not christine had the greatest difficulty in steering her partner through the maze on account of his self-will and when at last they reached the bottom of the long line she was breathless with her hard labour resting here she watched nick and his lady and though she had decidedly cooled off in these later months began to admire him anew nobody knew these dances like him after all or could do anything of this sort so well his performance with the dairyman's daughter so won upon her that when speed the plough was over she contrived to speak to him nick you are to dance with me next time he said he would and presently asked her in a formal public manner lifting his hat gallantly she showed a little backwardness which he quite understood and allowed him to lead her to the top a row of enormous length appearing below them as if by magic as soon as they had taken their places truly the squire was right when he said that they only wanted starting what is it to be whispered nicholas she turned to the band the honeymoon she said and then they trod the delightful last century measure of that name which if it had been ever danced better was never danced with more zest the perfect responsiveness which their tender acquaintance threw into the motions of nicholas and his partner lent to their gyrations the fine adjustment of two interacting parts of a single machine the excitement of the movement carried christine back to the time the unreflecting passionate time about two years before when she and nick had been incipient lovers only and it made her forget the carking anxieties the vision of social breakers ahead that had begun to take the gilding off her position now nicholas on his part had never ceased to be a lover no personal worries had as yet made him conscious of any staleness flatness or unprofitableness in his admiration of christine not quite so wildly nick she whispered i don't object personally but they'll notice us how came you here i heard that you had driven over and i set out on purpose for this what you have walked yes if i had waited for one of uncle's horses i should have been too late five miles here and five back ten miles on foot merely to dance with you what made you think of this old honeymoon thing oh it came into my head when i saw you as what would have been a reality with us if you had not been stupid about that license and had got it for a distant church shall we try again no i don't know i'll, I'll think it over the villagers admired their grace and skill as the dancers themselves perceived but they did not know what accompanied that admiration in one spot at least people who wonder they can foot it so featly together should know what some others think a waterman was saying to his neighbour then their wonder would be less his comrade asked for information well really i, I hardly believe it but tis said they be man and wife 
yes sure went to church and did the job a most afore twas light one morning but mind not a word of this for twould be the loss of a winter's work to me if i had spread such a report and it were not true when the dance had ended she rejoined her own section of the company her father and mr bellston the elder had now come out from the house and were smoking in the background presently she found that her father was at her elbow christine don't dance too often with young long as a mere matter of prudence i mean as folk might think it odd he being one of our own neighbouring farmers i should not mention this to ye if he were an ordinary young fellow but being superior to the rest it behooves you to be careful exactly papa said christine but the revived sense that she was deceiving him threw a damp over her spirits but after all she said to herself he is a young man of elsenford handsome able and the soul of honour and i am a young woman of the adjoining parish who have been constantly thrown into communication with him is it not by nature's rule the most proper thing in the world that i should marry him and is it not an absurd conventional regulation which says that such a union would be wrong it may be concluded that the strength of christine's large-minded argument was rather an evidence of weakness than of strength in the passion it concerned which had required neither argument nor reasoning of any kind for its maintenance when full and flush in its early days when driving home in the dark with her father she sank into pensive silence she was thinking of nicholas having to trudge on foot all those miles back after his exertions on the sward mr everard arousing himself from a nap said suddenly i have something to mention to ee by george so i have chris you probably know what it is she expressed ignorance wondering if her father had discovered anything of her secret well according to him you know it but i will tell ee perhaps you noticed young jim bellston walking me off down the lawn with him whether or no we walked together a good while and he informed me that he wanted to pay his addresses to ee i naturally said that it depended upon yourself and he replied that you were willing enough you had given him particular encouragement showing your preference for him by specially choosing him for your partner eh in that case says i go on and conquer settle it with her i have no objection the poor fellow was very grateful and in short there we left the matter he'll propose to-morrow she saw now to her dismay what james bellston had read as encouragement he has mistaken me altogether she said i had no idea of such a thing what you won't have him indeed i cannot chrissy said mr everard with emphasis there's nobody whom i should like so much you to marry as that young man he's a thoroughly clever fellow and fairly well provided for he's travelled all over the temperate zone but he says that directly he marries he's going to give up all that and be a regular stay-at-home you would be nowhere safer than in his hands it is true she answered he is a highly desirable match and i should be well provided for and probably very safe in his hands then don't be skittish and stand too she had spoken from her conscience and understanding and not to please her father as a reflecting woman she believed that such a marriage would be a wise one in great things nicholas was closest to her nature in little things bellston seemed immeasurably nearer than nick and life was made up of little things altogether the firmament looked black for nicholas long notwithstanding her half-hour's ardour for him when she saw him dancing with the dairyman's daughter most great passions movements and beliefs individual and national burst during their decline into a temporary irradiation which rivals their original splendour and then they speedily become extinct perhaps the dance had given the last flare-up to christine's love it seemed to have improvidently consumed for its immediate purpose all her ardour forwards so that for the future there was nothing left but frigidity nicholas had certainly been very foolish about that license chapter four 
this laxity of emotional tone was further increased by an incident when two days later she kept an appointment with nicholas in the sallows the sallows was an extension of shrubberies and plantations along the banks of the froom accessible from the lawn of froom everard house only except by wading through the river at the waterfall or elsewhere near the brink was a thicket of box in which a trunk lay prostrate this had been once or twice their trysting place though it was by no means a safe one and it was here she sat awaiting him now the noise of the stream muffled any sound of footsteps and it was before she was aware of his approach that she looked up and saw him wading across at the top of the waterfall noontide lights and dwarfed shadows always banished the romantic aspect of her love for nicholas moreover something new had occurred to disturb her and if ever she had regretted giving way to a tenderness for him which perhaps she had not done with any distinctness she regretted it now yet in the bottom of their hearts those two were excellently paired the very twin halves of a perfect whole and their love was pure but at this hour surfaces showed garishly and obscured the depths probably her regret appeared in her face he walked up to her without speaking the water running from his boots and taking one of her hands in each of his own looked narrowly into her eyes have you thought it over what whether we shall try again you remember saying you would at the dance oh i had forgotten that you are sorry we tried it all he said accusingly i am not so sorry for the fact as for the rumours she said ah rumours they say we are already married who i cannot tell exactly i heard some whispering to that effect somebody in the village told one of the servants i believe this man said he was crossing the churchyard early on that unfortunate foggy morning and heard voices in the chancel and peeped through the window as well as the dim panes would let him and there he saw you and me and mr bieland and so on but thinking his surmises would be dangerous knowledge he hastened on and so the story got afloat then your aunt too good lord what has she done the story was told her and she said proudly oh yes it is true enough i have seen the license but it is not to be known yet seen the license how the accidentally i believe when your coat was hanging somewhere the information coupled with the infelicitous word proudly caused nicholas to flush with mortification he knew that it was in his aunt's nature to make a brag of that sort but worse than the brag was the fact that this was the first occasion on which christine had deigned to show her consciousness that such a marriage would be a source of pride to his relatives the only two he had in the world you are sorry then even to be thought my wife much less to be it he dropped her hand which fell lifelessly it is not sorry exactly dear nick but i feel uncomfortable and vexed that after screwing up my courage my fidelity to the point of going to church you should have so muddled managed the matter that it has ended in neither one thing nor the other how can i meet acquaintances when i don't know what they are thinking of me then dear christine let us mend the muddle i'll go away for a few days and get another license and you can come to me she shrank from this perceptibly i cannot screw myself up to it a second time she said i am sure i cannot besides i promised mr bieland and yet how can i continue to see you after such a rumour we shall be watched now for certain then don't see me i fear i must not for the present altogether what i am very depressed these views were not very inspiriting to nicholas as he construed them it may indeed have been possible that he construed them wrongly and should have insisted upon her making the rumour true unfortunately too he had come to her in a hurry through brambles and briars water and weed and the shaggy wildness which hung about his appearance at this fine and correct time of day lent an impracticality to the look of him you blame me you repent your courses you repent that you ever ever owned anything to me 
no nicholas i do not repent that she returned gently though with firmness but i think that you ought not to have got that license without asking me first and i also think that you ought to have known how it would be if you lived on here in your present position and made no effort to better it i can bear whatever comes for social ruin is not personal ruin or even personal disgrace but as a sensible new-risen poet says whom i have been reading this morning the world and its ways have a certain worth and to press a point while those oppose were simple policy better wait as soon as you had got my promise nick you should have gone away yes and made a name and come back to claim me that was my silly girlish dream about my hero perhaps i can do as much yet and would you have indeed liked better to live away from me for family reasons than to run a risk in seeing me for affection's sake oh what a cold heart it has grown if i had been a prince and you a dairymaid i'd have stood by you in the face of the world she shook her head ah you don't know what society is you don't know perhaps not who was that strange gentleman of about seven-and-twenty i saw at mr bellston's christening feast oh that was his nephew james now he is a man who has seen an unusual extent of the world for his age he is a great traveller you know indeed in fact an explorer he is very entertaining no doubt nicholas received no shock of jealousy from her announcement he knew her so well that he could see she was not in the least in love with bellston but he asked if bellston were going to continue his explorations not if he settles in life otherwise he will i suppose perhaps i could be a great explorer too if i tried you could i am sure they sat apart and not together each looking afar off at vague objects and not in each other's eyes thus the sad autumn afternoon waned while the waterfall hissed sarcastically of the inevitableness of the unpleasant very different this from the time when they had first met there the nook was most picturesque but it looked horridly common and stupid now their sentiment had set a colour hardly less visible than a material one on surrounding objects as sentiment must where life is but thought nicholas was as devoted as ever to the fair christine but unhappily he too had moods and humours and the division between them was not closed she had no sooner got indoors and sat down to her work-table than her father entered the drawing-room she handed him his newspaper he took it without a word went and stood at the hearth-rug and flung the paper on the floor christine what's the meaning of this terrible story i was just on my way to look at the register she looked at him without speech you have married nicholas long no father no can you say no in the face of such facts as i have been put in possession of yes but the note you wrote to the rector and the going to church she briefly explained that their attempt had failed ah then this is what that dancing meant was it by blank it makes me blank how long has this been going on may i ask this what what indeed why making him your beau now listen to me all's well that ends well from this day madam this moment he is to be nothing more to you you are not to see him cut him adrift instantly i only wish his volk were on my farm out they should go or i would know the reason why however you are to write him a letter to this effect at once how can i cut him adrift why not you must my good maid well though i have not actually married him i have solemnly sworn to be his wife when he comes home from abroad to claim me it would be a gross perjury not to fulfil my promise besides no woman can go to church with a man to deliberately solemnize matrimony and refuse him afterwards if he does nothing wrong meanwhile the uttered sound of her strong conviction seemed to kindle in christine a livelier perception of all its bearings than she had known while it had lain unformulated in her mind 
for when she had done speaking she fell down on her knees before her father covered her face and said please please forgive me papa how could i do it without letting you know i don't know i don't know when she looked up she found that in the turmoil of his mind her father was moving about the room you are within an ace of ruining yourself ruining me ruining us all he said you are nearly as bad as your brother begad perhaps i am yes perhaps i am that i should father such a harem scarum brood it is very bad but nicholas he's a scoundrel he is not a scoundrel cried she turning quickly he's as good and worthy as you or i or anybody bearing our name or any nobleman in the kingdom if you come to that only only she could not continue the argument on those lines now father listen she sobbed if you taunt me i'll go off and join him at his farm this very day and marry him to-morrow that's what i'll do i don't taunt thee i wish to avoid unseemliness as much as you she went away when she came back a quarter of an hour later thinking to find the room empty he was standing there as before never having apparently moved his manner had quite changed he seemed to take a resigned and entirely different view of circumstances christine here's a paragraph in the paper hinting at a secret wedding and i'm blazed if it don't point to you well since this was to happen i'll bear it and not complain all folk have crosses and this is one of mine now this is what i've got to say i feel that you must carry out this attempt at marrying nicholas long faith you must the rumour will become a scandal if you don't that's my view i have tried to look at the brightest side of the case nicholas long is a young man superior to most of his class and fairly presentable and he's not poor at least his uncle is not i believe the old muddler could buy me up any day however a farmer's wife you must be as far as i can see as you have made your bed so you must lie parents propose and ungrateful children dispose you shall marry him and immediately christine hardly knew what to make of this he is quite willing to wait and so am i we can wait for two or three years and then he will be as worthy as you must marry him and the sooner the better if tis to be done at all and yet i did wish you could have been jim bellston's wife i did wish it but no i too wished it and do still in one sense she returned gently his moderation had won her out of her defiant mood and she was willing to reason with him you do he said surprised i see that in a worldly sense my conduct with mr long may be considered a mistake hm i'm glad to hear that after my death you may see it more clearly still and you won't have long to wait to my reckoning she fell into bitter repentance and kissed him in her anguish don't say that she cried tell me what to do if you'll leave me for an hour or two i'll think drive to the market and back the carriage is at the door and i'll try to collect my senses dinner can be put back till you return in a few minutes she was dressed and the carriage bore her up the hill which divided the village and manor from the market town end of story two chapters one through four